Hi guys, welcome to Flowcast, a podcast by Flowart, where we chat with successful entrepreneurs, freelancers, and other amazing professionals that are crushing it in their game. We are Flo and Peter, and we'll be your host on this audio journey. In this week's episode, we'll talk with Alan Tobin, Ireland's first Webflow partner. We'll get to know Alan, who is going to share how he discovered Webflow, his turn from front-end developer to a Webflow expert, and the future of no-code. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation. All right, Lex was set in the intro. Today we are here with one and only Alan Tobin. From being a biomedical scientist, surf instructor, and social media executive, to building lightning fast webflow sites for growing creative agencies. Alan, welcome to our podcast. Hi guys, thanks very much for having me on. I'm pretty excited about this. Likewise, likewise. So we, we already chatted about this uh, behind the camera a bit, but you, I, have, I got to ask you this. You have a really, really diverse background. Can you can you share this bit without like, how did you get from biomedical researcher to like building a Buffalo pages? Wow. Um, yeah, I suppose the short story is I was um, studying something I loved. I love science and I love, you know, biochemistry and immunology. But what I didn't love was the fact that you had to more than likely live in a city that was not going to be beside the coast. So uh, I, I worked in hospital labs and pharmaceutical labs, and I wasn't too into that lifestyle. So, um, yeah, I, I moved on to try and figure out how to live by the sea, essentially. And that's how I ended up being surf instructor and a lifeguard. And through that kind of work, I um, started playing with WordPress websites because of the different companies that I was working for. Everybody has a website. And I said that I they were like, do you know how to use this? I was like, sure, I'll figure it out. Went from WordPress to Wix to Shopify. And then I went and did a diploma in front-end development and it was during uh it was around that time that i found webflow so um yeah i think that my memory is that i'm i was looking i was definitely looking up solutions for html and css found webflow and i think it was a mega menu that i was trying to build for um for whatever project i was working on and i said i you know, sign up to this platform and try it out and built it super quickly and also realized that the quality of the code that I exported was like better than what I could write. It was clean, it was fast, and um, it was yeah, really well structured. So I actually started using Webflow to and a few projects that I was doing and no one knew any difference. And I was like, okay, this is great. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of that's the way I went around. And um, the way I became a Webflow expert was I was working with Shopify stores and I missed the opportunity to become a Shopify expert many years ago. And I just said to myself, when I realized what I thought was a super powerful development tool, it was Webflow. Um, I just said, it was, I wasn't going to let that happen again. So I, I made sure that uh, yeah, I became an expert, an official expert according to Webflow. <laughs> That's quite an amazing story. It's like, yeah, I would love to live by the sea. Uh, that was always my dream to like wake up, go to surf, or just, I don't know, go go jog to the seaside and then go to work. Yeah, it's so, pretty yeah. nice. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Like I've, myself and my partner, we have a house that literally it's, it's up on the hill, looking down onto the Atlantic Ocean and looking down on the local villages. It's right beside the cliffs of Moher. So on, on three sides, we're, we're surrounded by ocean. And uh, I'm four kilometers to the nearest uh, beach and about seven kilometers from work. So yeah, it's it's pretty good. I can't complain on that one. Yeah, yeah, nice. Can't complain. And like, how was the transition from going like into more, from like more academical field, like more research-based field, like coding, was just like, self-taught uh, during your first original job or it was just like you just decided okay I'm gonna cut this off 
I'm, I'm not going to be a scientist anymore. And then just start learning or. Um, I yeah, it, it's, it's a bit more complex than that because when I finished university, um, Ireland was in a really, really bad recession. Mm -hmm. um, so around that time, you know, a lot of my buddies had left. Like I was 24, 20, yeah, around 24, 25. And um, th there was not a lot of work around. You know, Ireland was in a really, really bad place in 2011, 2010, 11, 12. And um, there was just a, there wasn't a nice vibe in Ireland. And any of the jobs that I had in the science field, there was just this, air of nervousness in the area because people were worried about their jobs and there was a lot of um, disparities in wages between new people arriving into organizations and companies and people who've been there a lot longer and yeah it was it just wasn't a nice situation um uh, so I, there was kind of like a com collective in my opinion a collective me mental health issue and okay. I always wanted to travel and because I was a surfer, I was just like, I'm, I'm out of here. So around in 2012, I left for two years and um, that's where, yeah, I went over to Central America and just surfed for 18 months, I think. And no, a year, surfed a year in, eight, in Central America, met a girl who's now my partner. And then we moved to France and did a ski season and uh, she she and I, we moved back to Ireland in 2014. So around that time, I didn't go back into this, the kind of uh, science world. I, I was a bit fed up with it and was trying to figure out a way of, as I said, living by the sea. Worked for local businesses, a lot of stuff with surf instructing and lifeguarding, and uh, just realized that there was, um, there was actually similarities between stuff that I learned, like the way you, you think about things and coding and uh yeah just realized there was a lot of people with a lot of websites that needed help and that's yeah i mean yeah i guess going to the america to central or south american surf this is a winning strategy because like as far as i know also phil knight the founder of nike did the same ah nice <laughs> well look at him now <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's not bad being in the same uh, same <laughs> sentence as that person <laughs> But yeah, I mean, yeah, Australia, Slovenia was in the same situation. It was quite the opposite, though. So like the academic world was more safe. And then like the private and the industry was like a bit unstable. But yeah, Australia. And yeah, before we go on, like how will your family and friends describe you? Oh, loud. Loud? <laughs> yeah, probably loud and annoying <laughs> and <laughs> opinionated. <laughs> and you... I mean, you seem pretty open, like open to new opportunities. And would you think yeah. that that's your unique skill that has helped you become successful or getting get you to the point you are today? Or what would you be your like top skill, you think? Oh, uh, well, to, to uh, get me, I think to get me to where I am is I'm, I'm pretty stubborn. Um, so like working in the west of Ireland is there's there's not as much opportunities for like, quote unquote, good jobs, you know, high paying jobs. And um, as I said before, like I didn't, I never wanted to, like I lived in the city for university and it was super fun. I loved it. And I love going up to the cities for like one or two nights and then leaving, but I don't want to, it's not me. I don't want to be there, you know, 12 months a year. So that was my main goal was to not commute and not, uh, um, not have to live in a city and live in the countryside. So I, that was, I suppose that was the stubbornness inside me to try and figure something out. And like I was, I was remote working before remote working was, was a thing, you know? And uh, yeah, it's, it seems to be working out. All right. You work remotely full time. Do you have like an office to go to just work from home? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have an office. I, I'm very lucky that the town that I'm living uh, that I live in, that's uh, that I work in. That it, I used to live in this town. There's um, the local county council um, built this facility that has uh, seven offices of various, ranging from one to seven people in size, and then fourteen or sixteen hot desks. 
And when it opened, I, I got a contract for one of the offices. So I work out of there. And it's, yeah, as I said, it's about seven kilometers from my home. And it's probably one of the best decisions I made was separating home from work um, just to prevent me from continuously working. <laughs> it's just, there's nice, keep, keep work at work and home at home. Oh yeah, it's a big challenge uh, keeping that work-life balance when working remotely. Did you experience that as well? Yeah, um, yeah, I did. Like you guys probably recognize this as well. You'd get an idea. You know, sometimes if you have a problem and you can't figure it out between nine to five, it might dawn on you when you're, I don't know, at dinner or something. It's like, oh, that's the, maybe I'll try this thing and maybe I'll try that. And sometimes it even dawns when you're going, dawns on you when you're going for a walk. So mm. I'd be very bad when I used, I used to work from the spare room in the house where my partner would go, I don't know, for a shower. So I'd be doing nothing for whatever amount of time. And I just go into the spare room and I could be there from, you know, for another four hours trying to just, just be, I think more because I like what I do, you know, but mm. there's a danger there when you like what you do, you don't see it impacting on the other parts of your life. So yeah, I think it's important to have a separation. Oh yeah. And thank you for being so upfront about this. We really like uh, picking brains of the people we look up to, like, how does your typical day look like now? If you could uh, describe it shortly. Um, it's, I tried to do a nine to five. So I tried to go into work at nine and leave at five. And that's like, a, a you know, just because I work for myself, just to put those boundaries on, on myself to make sure that I'm not overworking. But I'll tell what I did this morning was I got up at, I don't know, like half six, 6.30. And I put on my wetsuit. I drove down to the beach, went surfing till about 9.30 got into work for 10 um yeah and then i've i just started a project this week so i've, I've my calendar blocked off for one client and just got working on that straight away and yeah had lunch went back to work at two and now i'm talking to you guys and i'll clock off probably at we'll do this for another 45 minutes or an hour and i'll, I'll clock off probably 30 minutes after that <laughs> Oh, yeah. so today was today was a nice day i got to surf in first you know nice yeah always good uh, to start the day off on the waves uh, yeah, yeah i awesome. really i really like um, how we explored your mindset to begin this podcast with and i'm sure we'll get back to this but now i really want to know what was the journey uh to becoming the first weblog partner in ireland like hmm um i might go back to my stubbornness I, I just kept hounding them. I, I, I actually, uh, the way it kicked off was I was working a lot with Shopify at the time and um, Shopify have a really good uh, kind of not, yeah, kind of partnership referral program. And um, I just kept, I think it was Ethan who was the guy I was mess messaging inside in Webflow I kept messaging saying, you guys need to have a referral program. You need to have a partnership program because, you know, in terms of like a business decision for me, I'm better off working with Shopify, even though I love working with Webflow. So I was, you know, every, no, I wouldn't say every week, but maybe every month or six weeks, I was emailing, um, emailing them, asking about um, what their plans were for the future. And then I'd say they just got sick of me and they just emailed me back saying, here's sign up to this partnership expert program and <laughs> uh, signed up to it and got, uh, it was like a, a waiting list. And then they had their, um, the few tests that you have to do. And the minute that came in, like, I didn't even wait. I just did the, did the test that night. And uh, when I was um, getting my profile set up, there was no, option to choose Ireland so I had a call I was booked into a Calendly or something with with one of the staff I think it was, his, his name was Ethan and I was just like look you know I'm not putting in the UK I want to put in Ireland because I'm based in Ireland and mm -hmm. um, then he's like oh yeah I'll set that up for you and he set it up and I just go does that mean I'm the first 
He's like, what do you mean? Does that mean I'm the first in Ireland? He's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're the only one. It's like, oh, I'll take that one. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, good story and a good lesson for our listeners and also for us with Peter, the stubbornness pays off a lot of the times. Uh, have you tried out any other no-code website builders uh, before? Um, um, well, like I, I used Shopify, but that's real template-based and drag and drop. Um, and I was working a good bit with Liquid. And I did some stuff with Wix as well but I found it quite clunky. Um, and then, so yeah, not, not really. Um, it was, yeah, you know, the, 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 those two platforms, there was just so many limitations in terms of like what you visually see. Like they're awesome tools, like the Wix is like its marketing platform is awesome. And, and Shopify is an amazing e-commerce system, but it was the, the, the being able to just completely make up have a, have an idea or have like data giving you an, um, a solution and being able to use uh, being able to implement that without having to make compromises is why I I stayed with Webflow um, and since then um, I was I did try Editor X and it's the new version of the no code version for Wix and that was pretty good. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't awesome. Like it's, uh, someone described it to me before. It's like Canva versus um, like Adobe products. It's okay. not. Um, and the thing with, with Webflow is, in my opinion, I'm, I'm like, when I'm building something in Webflow, I'm coding in my mind and I'm just, it's, you're visually expressing that. But with Wix, you're not coding really. It's a lot of things are absolute positioning and, um yeah it's it's a little bit different still though it's it, it, people are doing awesome stuff on that platform too yeah i feel like vix is a perfect solution for i don't know when you don't really have technical knowledge and you want to set up your own small business or like a side hustle and that's vix then it's a pretty good pretty good option to set up a simple landing page with i don't know three or four sections but as soon as it comes to more technical and more personalized stuff, then yeah, you're pretty limited. And the like underlying code is also pretty buggy. Yeah, that, that was one of the, the things that actually blew me away with Webflow was the like everything is rendered static and you're literally just it's just HTML and CSS and a bit of their JavaScript. Like whereas everything else seemed to everything else, every other platform that I might have used there's just layers of code on top of themselves and pulling different APIs, pulling from different APIs and can make pretty slow websites. Yeah, I agree on this. Like Webflow of code is really, really clean, but you also work with WordPress, right? And Yeah, I did, but um, yeah, I did. Yeah, and how would you compare WordPress to Webflow? Because WordPress is huge. It's like, I don't know where we are from, like, most people use WordPress. They like they see WordPress also as a no code tool. But um, how would you compare it to? You? So I see WordPress as a code tool, and, okay. and I think when trying to make WordPress into a no code tool, it has caused um, that. That's is, yeah. So WordPress in itself is amazing. If you are okay. a WordPress developer who works with PHP, it is awesome. Okay. It, the addition of, of uh, plugins on top of that to turn WordPress into a drag and drop builder or to turn it into a no code tool, that's where, in my opinion, WordPress is, uh, it's, it becomes slow, buggy, becomes very heavy. Um, and I think people, they're getting a little bit of a raw deal with those products, but that's, um, yeah, that, that, that would be the way I'd look at it as a coding tool. Like if you were to hard code WordPress from the start, awesome, go for it. Okay. But to use it as a no code tool, I think right now, I don't think it's, um, it's at the races. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Like where Webflow excels, like when it's like really better than competition. 
Um, like, why would you suggest Webflow over WordPress, for example? Almost, uh, I would um, almost uh, maybe everything except e-commerce. Okay, I think. Um, for the majority of like, if you're going super complex and going to like a WordPress developer who is going to build it from the bottom up, then WordPress probably still out muscles Webflow. No, it definitely does. If you're going for full customization, you're going to a really top WordPress developer. Yeah, WordPress out muscles Webflow in that department. Um, but they're very unique situations. They're very, they're probably, you know they're not everyday websites yeah, for sure. um but to like if you wanted to get um i don't know if you're a startup and you want a five page website that you're going to add to in the future and you need this done relatively quickly you got your designs ready that's that's where i think that because to to do that with wordpress and to do it right it's slower to get it done and, and probably more expensive because the skill is is really complex. But if you want to get it done fast on WordPress and you skip, um, yeah, you kind of, you go for the more mid-range option. That's exactly. where you kind of go into difficulties. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and since we since we already started comparing Webflow and WordPress, yeah, can you also expand a bit about SEO options like uh, Webflow, how Webflow stacks against WordPress? Um, I I don't think either of them are better than each other. Like, um, I'm not an SEO expert. I just set up the websites so that they can be, um, when an expert uses it, they're yeah. they're going to be able to nail it on on um, SEO. So, um. Well, I suppose if you're going into like technical SEO and like semantic HTML, the ability to do that on Webflow is, in my opinion, like you have to hard code that in WordPress over uh, in Webflow. You still have to understand HTML um, to get that, you know, optimized on Webflow too. But um, yeah, this is kind of, uh, it's a difficult thing to discuss because there it, it depends on the, the person using the tool whether or not the results okay. are going to be optimum i just prefer using webflow over wordpress and like you could create a webflow website that is as awful seo but again it's when i'm comparing wordpress to webflow i'm usually comparing it to when someone has added a built a website using elementor or use divi and they make something look pretty, but they don't fully understand, you know, how to structure their headings and, um, you know, how to create sections correctly and all that type of stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the software itself is not like the only factor of the SEO, but like from developer, the marketing team, the SEO experts. Yeah, I've seen a lot of SEO optimized websites from Webflow and from WordPress and also other platforms. And you write a lot about SEO and importance of speed. Like mm -hmm. why why is load speed so important and why do you emphasize it so much? Um, uh, why do I emphasize it so much? Because Google says it's important. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> Google have given us this aw these awesome tools like with page speeds and Lighthouse. And if they say it's important, I'm, you know, literally, if they say jump, I'm saying, oh, I, that's it. And they've given, they've basically given you like a roadmap, how to make your website super fast. And they say they're punishing you. So, you know, I'm going to listen to them. Um, the, why do I think it's really important is, yeah, you, you guys have probably noticed this. Like we, our attention span is so short, like, especially with the, the world of TikTok that we're in, you know, 15 second videos, like we're, we're competing with huge industries that their whole expertise is grabbing our attention. So if, if a website lags, if it doesn't have its, you know, if it's HTTP instead of HTTPS and you have to an extra click to get into it, 
if uh, it doesn't say exactly what you need in the first you know seconds that you eyeball the site or if like something really important doesn't load on time you know we're we're just we're in a very competitive market for attention so that's why i'm i'm pr going pretty hard on the the speed at which the website loads um not necessarily the speed at how you build a site but the optimizing for page speed and you know some people disagree with me um and there are there are situations where it's not as important like if the objective of the website is to get a conversion of some sort then yes i would say speed is important but if the objective of the, of the website is like to wow someone and to blow their mind with these amazing animations and like work that they've done then maybe speed is like the secondary objective yeah it depends on the objective of the the person who owns the website yeah what you just said in the end to like impress someone with the website and like wow them i feel like sometimes because in webflow it's so much easier to do animations and i mean for like more easy like not the most complex animations can still be done without code like i feel like so, some webflow de developers and kind of like really really forcing them so it takes like a couple of minutes to open a website because then it's like just one big animation the whole website <laughs> and it like 10 minutes to even like scroll through like a like a simple landing page but it's fun like yeah it it's is so much fun building these animations so like i don't know like go for it as well <laughs> and i've definitely over animated sites because i'm just having fun doing it so if that's what you want to do go for it I'm yeah, happy, sure. you know, <laughs> it, you know, working with Webflow animations is just, it's ridiculously fun. Um, so, so yeah. And, you know, th that's actually one of the things that I've, I've um, done with animations is if you go to like Google Lighthouse and you see the speed at which they want the site to be built, um, load in, make sure your animations load in that time. Like it's sub three seconds. Don't have like five second animations. Have like two second and two and a half second animations. And just make sure if you're having like a page, um, you know, like a page load animation that um what I if if someone wanted something super complex, I would try and reduce it down so that it's it trig it it's completed by the time Google wants the page to be loaded. And I would add it to a global class so that it doesn't have to do it every single time to every single page and okay. yeah because you, you can still optimize these animations for for speed yeah i saw i saw your website it's a lot of animation and it, it looks really fun but it's also fast so <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah uh we will we'll put the, the link of your website in the description part so everyone can see how to do the animations properly to still optimize the website Cool. It might, yeah, it, it changes every month because I, I just get fed up with my site and I do it. <laughs> nice. But yeah, how do you approach building styles and components in Webflow? Say that again? How do you approach building uh, uh, styles and components in Webflow? Uh, how do I approach building styles and components? Um, I, I try and think of it the same way I would if I was using VS Code. Um, mm -hmm. If I was coding from the from the bottom um, yeah custom coding um i'd always have like but well, at the moment I'm, I'm working all the time with with fin suite which makes life super helpful and um, it's amazing amazing what they've done and i would yeah I'd, I'd hit the style guide first to make sure that everything is um as it is under design so I usually I, I prefer working with designers. So I, I like when I get my style guide from someone else. They give me the design. I set up the style guide first. And then I would start building out. Um I always start with the hero and the static elements. And then once I've the hero and the static elements done, I would build out the uh, dynamic com components. Um and the dynamic components, I, I think of them two ways. There's like CMS um components and then there is the the symbol components the ones i would use throughout the site um and i would it would depend on what which comes first in the design which i would build out first but yeah that that's kind of very basic synopsis of how i do it and what do you think comes first a wireframe wireframe or copy 
or the website? Uh, wireframe or copy, is it? Yeah, yeah. So the like the content or the website wireframe? I've done one job where I got the copy first and I and then designed the website around the copy. And that was really fun because you're inside the head of a different creative. Um, okay. I think the biggest, uh, I would definitely get the copy done before it goes to UI and prototyping. And because well, from my experience, what's happened is that the copy ends up being the last thing that the client thinks about. They also think that they can do it themselves a lot of the times because they just think it's writing, which is, I don't think that's true. But I would definitely get a copywriter on board from, if it's possible, get a copywriter on board straight away, like even at the discovery stage so that they can start picking the mind of the, the, the company you're working for and start working in symbiosis with the designer. Because mm -hmm. sometimes like copy can trigger an amazing design and vice versa, an amazing design can trigger good copy. Um, so I would have them right there at the start. The, the wireframes probably would come first to just like the very, very initial, like the hand drawings of how you think the site might be structured. And then once you got approval of that, I would go into copy and design. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, and yeah, besides that, what we learned about all the amazing features the Webflow has and how fun is it, are there any features that you're missing in Webflow? I uh, would really love to see them soon. Yeah, I'm actually trying to figure, uh, I'm, I'm working on a site at the moment, which has one, two, I'm looking at it here, one, two, three, like maybe 12 or 15 background videos that want that I want to connect to a CMS. Mm -hmm. So please, Webflow, allow us to add background videos directly to the database. <laughs> and that would, I would love to see that. Um, it's pretty cool at the moment. It, it adds a bit of, bit more fun to your, that I, well, I think just a bit of fun having to figure out this problem in Webflow and um, potentially using third-party hosting or maybe self-hosting in Webflow and um, um, and adding those links to the CMS. But yeah, if we could upload videos directly to the CMS as and, and use them as background videos, that would be amazing. I got you. Uh, we already talked about your work with clients uh, a little bit. Um, I'm wondering, how do you get new projects and new clients these days? Um, mainly through LinkedIn. Um, and I have hired a guy to... Um, help me as well. So um, I get a lot of referrals still, but a lot of communication with people through LinkedIn. And then, yeah, I've outsourced um, some client, I suppose, sales work to a guy. Um, and that's, yeah, that it, that's really helps. The, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the thing about the internet is it almost tricks you into thinking you can do everything yourself. And it tells you you, sh you can. And which is true, but like, you know, working as a freelancer or even running your own business, there's, I'm not awesome at sales. I'm really bad. So <laughs> try and get someone else to help me with that. I'm not good at copywriting. I hire in a copywriter. I like designing, but there are better designers out there than me. So I hire in designers. And whenever, like, it's it's a risk. It's frightening hiring in people, but whenever... Um, Whenever you, whenever I have hired in someone to help me in different parts of my business, it's made my business better. And yeah, so I, I don't do it all myself. That's I don't get all my clients myself. I get I get help. Yeah, bootstrapping is a really fun learning opportunity. But as time goes on, uh, I'm sure it's better to optimize things. And you've talked about uh, some people who are on your team or you're working with. Um, mm -hmm. Are you the only one? doing the development or do you have some uh yeah i do i'm the only one that does the dev work yeah um yeah it's yeah i don't i don't don't outsource the dev work yet um it's it's just me all right and uh is it like those people you work with are there freelancers uh, that you just cooperate with or is it like a 
team that works together all the time? Um, we're not a team that works together all the time. Um, the, uh, depending on the product, yeah, they're they're freelancers, and depending on uh, who like acquires the work, um, usually they manage it. Um, and yeah, so we just we work together depending on the project, and yeah, it's just uh, we're not. We're all, we're all kind of running our own little businesses, I suppose, is the way to look at it. And then when every, uh, either of us or any of us need each other, we or we jump in. All right. Nice system. Uh, I'm glad it's working for you. Um, Ireland is a known tech hub in Europe. What's the Webflow community like over there? The Webflow community is class. They are so sound. Um, we're very, very small. There's actually a Webflow or named Juniper who lives like you don't realize how small the part of Ireland that I live in and there's two of us within like four kilometers five kilometers from each other we still haven't actually met <laughs> but, but yeah it's like it, there it's a really small community really sound people really enthusiastic they really love what they're doing um and yeah they're they're just really cool um I met up with two web floors, Matt and Ben in Dublin about about a month ago. Um, there was a, one of them threw up like a, maybe a, a tweet saying anybody want to meet. And yeah, we, a few of us jumped on it and we drove up. It was actually the date. Do you remember a couple of, about a month ago, Webflow was down and Webflow Twitter was going nuts and it was like, yeah, oh, we can't do anything. So like I, I drove up, or not drove up, I got the train up and um, I was super late meeting the guys and um, I booked into um, a you know ro remote working hub there in Dublin and got got to the guys and I was like oh I'm super sorry like I'm really sorry I'm you know you're gonna only gonna have 15 or 20 minutes with you now and they're like no nah, can't even work if we want to so we like nerded out about Webflow for about three and a half hours had about 17 coffees and was just like shaking <laughs> afterwards <laughs> But yeah, it was really lovely, and it it was um, and it was kind of strange because it's the first people in the Webflow community that I met in person. Like everybody else I've met, have just been little heads on screens. Mm, yeah, um, that day or two when Webflow was down really showed that um, how good the community, actually the international Webflow community, is. There were, wasn't a lot of toxicity, even though people couldn't do the work. Uh, so yeah, uh, it was. Kind of a nice moment in webflow history uh, yeah. and talking about ireland uh what about the clients do you usually target domestic or international market um i target both um i i work for a few american clients and um a good few irish clients and clients in the uk and then a few in europe as well um but yeah i, I target uh, it's probably 50% Irish and 50% international clients. Do you notice any difference working with clients from Europe or from Ireland compared to the American market? Besides uh, the time zone, of course. The American clients tend to be... Um, yeah, there, there is differences. There is cultural differences. Uh, there is... Um, like the Irish clients would be um, more involved, I suppose, because they, they'd be smaller businesses. So they would have more of like a vested interest in how they are perceived. Whereas the um, international clients, the bit, I suppose it's more dependent on the size of the client. If the client is smaller and mm -hmm. a smaller team, then there is more in, like, direct interest from the, the 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 client whereas when the team is bigger the clients are there, there's a chain of command i suppose so they they put more responsibility on you because it's like we're paying you to do this if you don't deliver it's on you kind of thing so in one sense it's easier because they let you do your thing but i suppose the risk of of making a mistake is higher Whereas the smaller, I'm going to say Irish clients, but smaller clients, 
it might be on your shoulder a bit more, but there's less chance of a big, mm -hmm. big disaster. Yeah. yeah, definitely. We see this better in ourselves since we also work with American and also European clients. And yeah, a big, big, big difference. And since like you already talked uh, about Webflow community and since the community is so strong and it's getting only stronger, what do you think about the future of NoCode? I'm really, really excited about all the logic that's coming in. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really, I got really excited about the Fin Suite um, video that they did on Webflow as a front end. And just that idea was just like, it really, I, I really resonated with me. It's just like the possibilities are, I think they're almost endless because going back to what we were talking about earlier about the speed at which sites load, it loads fast because all it is is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And if that's what you're working with, then there is no reason why we can't plug anything into Webflow as a front end. So I'm I'm really excited about how this next 12 months and like we're talking here before the Webflow conference. So perhaps they're going to talk about Webflow logic and I've been playing with the beta and the membership beta and they're very early stages, but they're good. Like it's going to be really good. And I, I'm just really excited about how um how this this next step is going to go because we're going to move from Webflow being like uh, all singing, all dancing, front end, pretty site to being, yeah, you're going to have Webflow backend nerds, you know, you're not just going, you're going to have designers, animators, front end devs, people who understand the CMS back, like it's, uh, and then people who are able to plug in any kind of connection through like either Zapier or Make or through their own APIs. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's endless. And it's the tools out there are getting more powerful. It's amazing. Yeah, we're really bullish on no code industry as well. And can you imagine? Do you, do you think that, like, I don't know, in like year or two or three, uh, programmers or at least web development would be fully no code? So web designers, web developers won't be writing any code, like no code anymore. Um, I don't think so. No. I just think it's going to be uh, I, I, like because you're going to need developers to write code for the tools that we're using. Oh you know? yeah, so, I like this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think like I mean, from the point I view it, it's like the like developers would actually build the software and do like the IA stuff and stuff like this. But then the whole like website development would be will be done like just with no code tools. Potentially. Um, potentially, but we would need a big organization like even Webflow to take that step. You mm -hmm. know, um, I can't see Facebook or Google moving directly over to no code, but they they might use marketing tools in no code tools and maybe like use Webflow to build out the site, export the code and connect it to their own hosting servers potentially something like that. Um, but I think there's going to be a place for everybody. Like I, I keep comparing it to the digital camera. When the digital camera came out, people thought it was the end of photography. And the, the creativity that has come from using a digital camera and then, then with Photoshop, people thought Photoshop was the end of photography. But the amount of just amazing things people have done with these tools and are still doing with these tools and it's getting more and more creative. And then in the last like 10 years, people went back to film camera because yeah. they just liked the aesthetic or it was a different feel and style. So I don't know. I know that coding is not necessarily the same as an art like photography, but it, there's, there's similarities. And, you know, at the end of the day, potentially, like, Maybe with the way you're saying it, it might because you know we started with binary and then we went to languages and now there's libraries on top of languages, and now we've got no code on top of, like because Webflow is essentially on top of jQuery, you know, mm -hmm. especially the animation. So maybe, but someone has to write all that code to make sure it works and yeah.
Yeah, so. I yeah, I see where you're coming from. And yeah, I mean, I'm really excited for the future and I hope to get this answer as soon as possible. And to move a bit from like the technical part to like a big back to more general stuff, since you have a really, really diverse background, what advice would you give to yourself? Like, like imagine you're like 20 years old and you can talk with yourself. What advice would you give to yourself? Uh, if I was 18, I know the advice yeah. I'd give myself. If I was okay. 18 and I just finished high school, I would say, don't go to university straight away. Um, I loved university. And if you want, if it's, I would definitely advise myself to go to university, but I wouldn't go to university at 18 because when you're 18 and you've left home and you go to university, it's a way too much. In my experience, it was too much fun to concentrate on everything that you were meant to be doing in university. So I would advise my 18 year old self to, um, yeah, take a year out, I don't know, work in a bar in the city where your buddies are living or something and uh, maybe go to university in two or three years time. But I, I went back to university 10 years after I finished it. So we can always go back. Yeah, that was my plan, but my parents weren't a fan of it. So I went to university straight away anyways. Yeah, well, so are mine. Like I, I wanted to take at least a year off and um, it just didn't work for me. I had so much fun that and I literally passed my exams at the end of first year by like a percent, you know, uh -huh. you know, I got the bare minimum. And then second year, um, I can't remember, was there 14 exams over the whole year and I failed 13 of them. So <laughs> I ended up taking yeah. a year out and repeating second year and going back in on third year. And that year out was, you know, at the time it was pretty devastating. I was super embarrassed about it failing yeah. all these exams and my buddies had moved in a year different direction because they were you know a year away from me in college and stuff and I was going back into a new group of people but it was the best thing that could have happened for me my final results were way better because I was that year older and like I literally scraped past first year failed second year and then did really well in my final couple of years so yeah yeah, I mean, those years are like really crucial for self-development of finding yourself and yeah, just got to find your own pace and go with the flow. And what is then like the best advice you ever, you ever heard and how did you implement it? Oh, uh, the best advice you ever heard was, I think it was um, when I was traveling, I met so many people that were I suppose I saw this as opposed to gotten the advice off them was so many people were doing things their own way. Like there is multiple ways to live life. You don't have to, um, you don't have to do things the way everybody else does them. And there's so many things that you can do and see, and you can, you can change um, the course of what you're doing. Like you don't have to stick to what you're doing just because that's the way you thought it should be. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose the thing is, is that I, I saw how much diversity there was and how you can live, um, how you can make money. If you want to make money, if you don't want to make money, you don't have to make money. There's multiple ways of having a really fulfilled, nice life. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose seeing the way people live their lives differently was, um, that, that was pretty awesome actually. Uh, that's uh, amazing uh, advice and insight. And um, I like to ask you a few more questions because we usually finish this podcast with five uh, rapid fire questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to list them and whenever you're ready. Uh, okay. So you're just going to say it and I have to say the first thing that comes to my head. Yeah. I mean, uh, our guests at the podcast are usually people with complex knowledge from different areas. So they're usually not that quick to answer, but give us a long winded <laughs> answer. So if you need more time, you're welcome to take it. Uh, but what's your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book was Train Spotting. The film, uh, the book of the film is mind blowing. It, there's, and it, and it was, I think it's the fourth last chapter is, oh, I, 
it, it blew my mind just how it, it, it was just speaking the, the particular whatever stage I was in my life when I first read it it was um yeah just going into complexities of how people can live I think it was the fourth or the fifth last chapter it was amazing yeah yeah I watched the movie didn't read the book so I'll add it to the list um, yeah it's awesome your favorite podcast <laughs> the flow podcast <laughs> Flowcast. Yeah. <laughs> Flowcast. Um, I would say the the Blind Boy podcast. It's um, do you, have you heard of that? He's an Irish. Um, he's an Irish artist, and he was a part of a band when I was in college. And now he does these podcasts ranging from like art, so um, sociology. He's done a lot of stuff on. Um, Cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBD, CBT, and that's really helped me. I never knew what it was, and I've um, used some of the, the little tricks and tools that he's he's had to just to help me with my own life. So yeah, check that one out. Okay, your favorite no code tool? Webflow, yeah. definitely, hundred percent. Most used app on your phone? Probably Instagram or the Gmail app, YouTube, YouTube or Instagram, probably YouTube at this stage. Yeah. And your favorite hobby? Surfing. Straight up. If I, that, if I could do that every day, I would. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing this and so many other things with us today. We appreciate your, the time you took for us uh, and we can yeah, no wait worries. to catch up again. Yeah. No, that was great. Thanks for reaching out, guys. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Really love talking with you. And yeah, hope we do this again one more time. Yeah, 100%.